Hello, good evening Tacloban, good evening uh, Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao, the three islands of the Philippines. Yes. Isang mapagpalang gabi po sa ating lahat. And mm-hmm. we continue to speak life and blessing to everyone who is with us right now. And of course, I just want to say good morning and good afternoon to some other parts of the world. And this is your Coach Fred. And Coach Ariel. And you are now tuning in to Kingdom, Kingdom Talk. Talk Philippines. Yes. So, our guest for tonight is Sir Gregory Stark Pettis. Mm-hmm. Sir Gregory Pettis is a certified financial planner with wow. over 34 years oh. <laughs> of experience in the financial services industry. Wow. As a CFP, he has worked with thousands of high net worth, worth individuals, mm-hmm. successful business owners, and their legal and tax planning teams to implement state planning techniques, complex wealth mm-hmm. transfer concept, business transition strategies, executive benefits, and creative uses of charitable trust. Mm-hmm. Oh. He attended Georgetown College and also has the professional designations of CHFC or Chartered Financial Consultant mm-hmm. and CLU or Chartered Life Underwriter. Wow. Though a collaborative team, I mean through a colorat, colora, collaborative team, <laughs> planning approach with attorneys and CPAs, Craig helps blended families to both reach their personal financial goal and expand their impact with multi-generational wealth transfer. Sir Greg is an ordained pastor with a focus on mm. helping those less fortunate, especially those in prisons. Wow. And in the nation in in the nation of India. He resides in Springfield, Illinois with Janita, his wife of 30 years, wow, and is the proud father of six children and a grandson. My dear Kingdom citizens and ambassadors, may I have the honor to present to your guest for tonight, Sir Gregory Stark Pettis from, from Springfield, okay. Illinois. Thank you, Ariel and Percy, wow. my fellow Kingdom Ambassadors. Yes. Welcome from L- the land of Lincoln, Springfield, wow. Illinois. Today I'm excited being on my first broadcast and I'm looking forward to what the Lord's going to talk to us about finances in the kingdom. Money and possessions It is a focal point right now. The globe is in a turmoil. There are Markets are down, uh, valuations are chaotic and God's people need wisdom and counsel from the Word of God as to how to remain stable and be strong in these times and how to take advantage of various opportunities. So after we launch today, we're going to be sharing three principles, kingdom vision and multi-generational wealth transfer. And thirdly, we're going to be discussing the practical side of financial planning, how to set goals, to establish your risk profile, and to assess your current portfolio and assess your current uh, assets, and to develop strategies with your team of excellent kingdom advisors to get you most efficiently from point A where you are now to those goals that the Lord has given you. And then of course, how to take action on those strategies and how to review your plan. So just a little bit about myself uh, before we launch into today's program, being that it's my first time here. And again, I'm so honored and humbled to be a part of Kingdom Talk. Thank you, Ariel. Thank you, Percy. I was not raised in the church. I was not a church going uh, young man. Uh, when I was eight years old, I opened the back window of my bedroom and I looked up to heaven and I shouted, God, whoever you are, why am I here on this little planet called Earth, and, and where am I going to go when I die? That, that was my best prayer. Well, to make a long story short, my mother, who was a brilliant special education teacher, artist, and musician, had married my Air Force pilot father, and we went global. Mother spun the globe in 1969, said, kids, pick any country where you want to be, 
and we ended up in Bangkok, Thailand in 1969 and 70. I was in the sixth grade. I was just began to learn Thai fluently and enjoy the, the culture. And that's where I fell in love with Asia, which was my major focal calling right now. And then we came home and, you know, the, the, thing, the thing about my mother, she was such an adventuresome and courageous woman. She spun the globe again and said, let's go travel some more. I ended up in St. Thomas Virgin Islands in my, my seventh and eighth grade year, actually eighth and ninth grade years. And all what I was sharing here is that all these trips around the globe, I, I got to see the, some of the wonders of the world. I saw some of the most beautiful things this world has to offer and still, had those two questions. Why am I here on the earth and where am I going when I die? Well, thank God he sends his word to heal us and deliver us from our destructions, amen? In a biology class in my sophomore year in high school, the Lord opened up the word through a wonderful man of God now, a good preacher friend, and he opened it up and shared the Romans road and the Lord convicted me and I repented of my sins that spring of 75. He's lifted the questions off my mind and he's become my reason for living and become my future and I'm so glad to know Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior to be baptized in the spirit and be called as a teacher to the body of Christ not just behind a pulpit but going out into the world to share the truths of God's word in the marketplace as 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 we learn in Revelation we are all kings and priests well let's jump right into the first kingdom principle Kingdom vision. Kingdom vision. The doctor, Dr. Miles Monroe said, eyes that see are common, but eyes that look with vision are rare. And how true that is. Sight, he said, is a function of the eyes, but vision is a function of the heart. Helen Keller said, the only thing worse than being blind is having sight but having no vision. And Jesus said it this way in Matthew 6, 22 through 23. He said, the eyes are the light of the body. If your eye is single, now in the amplified version, single means spiritually perceptive, clear. If our eyes have kingdom vision given to us by God, then our whole life is full of light. And, and, but if our eyes are squinty with greed and distrust and fear, then our lives are like a dank, dark basement. Vision. One of the most powerful passages in the Word of God about kingdom vision to me is in Matthew chapter 17, verses 24 through 27. And what we have here is the account where Jesus and Peter are discussing whether or not that he should pay the temple tax. Now, that's Matthew 17, if you want to go there, 24 through 27. Now, Peter had just been approached by some of those in the, in the, synagogue, in the synagogue saying, does your master pay the temple tax? Everyone 20 and older has to contribute a half a shekel a year for the upkeep of the temple. <clears throat> well, Peter said, yeah, he does. He was far away from the home where Jesus was, was staying, but when he walked into the home, Jesus said to him, Peter, what do you think? Do children of the kings pay tax, or is it just the peasants, the foreigners, and the strangers? And Peter said, well, just the peasants, foreigners, and strangers, Lord. And Jesus said, yes, but so that we don't offend them. Here's what I want you to do now. Now listen to this. Listen how Jesus is giving Peter vision. He is partnering with his profession. He is imparting into his industry. He is becoming covenantly connected with his career. He's telling a fisherman who's been doing this for decades how to go fish. I love it. But not just how to, how to do it with perception that's clear about what God is trying to do today in the earth. So here goes the instruction. Peter, go down to the lake. Throw your line in and the first fish that you catch, 
is going to have a full shekel in his mouth. Hallelujah. One half a shekel for you, Peter. One half a shekel for me. Open his mouth and pay our taxes. Let's give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give everything to God. Hallelujah. Well, you know the story. So here's the thing that the Lord has been showing me about kingdom vision from this passage. First of all, our Lord Jesus Christ is totally omnipotent and omniscient. Praise his holy name. He actually spoke into a fish's life and not just any fish, but the one that could handle the full shekel. Don't you know God has a fish waiting for you? Don't you know God has a, a resource with him as your source? Key number one, Jesus is always our source and uses an innumerable amount of creatures and circumstances, people, places, and things, connections in the kingdom and connections out of the kingdom that are coming into the kingdom. He told that fish, now you go take that little shekel on the bottom of the lake, you eat that, and when you see a hook from my Peter, you latch onto that hook. It doesn't even say he used, he used any bait. Our God is so powerful, he's preparing a fish for you. Another thing I see is that Jesus always knew the purpose for a particular portion of money. He could have told Peter, hey, yeah, we need to pay that shekel. Go get Judas and bring the bag and let's pay the tax out of the bag. No, no. Jesus wanted to demonstrate a powerful principle of partnering with us in our profession. He could have said, go ahead, get the shekel from Judas. <clears throat> But that money had a different purpose. That money's kingdom purpose was to supply the needs of the ministry for he and 12 apostles and their families. Wow, quite a bag of money, I must say. We could talk about that some other time. But this time, the purpose of the shekel was to demonstrate God's vision is to partner with his people in a profession. He's to impart in our industry. He is to covenant with us as Christ in our career. Hallelujah. Now here's Peter. He's been fishing for decades and he knows what to do. He knows what bait is going to be bite, what they're going to bite on today down at the lake. He knows what time of day to go down there. But the Lord said, therefore... Because Peter had just confessed the chapter prior in Matthew 16, you are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. He, that anointed revelation had come to him about the kingdom. He said, okay, if the king says go to the lake and there's where my money will be, I'm going to the lake. A fish, a shekel, never before in the history of fishing have we ever had an event like this. So he goes down there and he says, I'm going to not lean to my own understanding and all of my ways acknowledge my Lord. And don't you know, they who know their God are strong and do exploits. Daniel 11:32. So here's Peter puts the hook in and the fish under the power of the Lord God has been brought to Peter. Don't you know God brings to you through various resources and he will teach you what the purpose of the money is. And here comes Peter. He pulls that thing out, takes the coin. There it is. Glory to God. And he pays the shekel tax. God is our source. Everything else is our resource. We got to keep our eyes on the Lord during these tough times and not allow ourselves to look at the resource that has been diminished. That may not have the coin this time. There may be a raven bringing it this time. There, there may be a connection in the kingdom that we, there may be some new brilliant ideas. In fact, my friends, I believe that God is commanding fish in this season. He's bringing resources, kingdom resources, and giving us wise counsel to know what is the purpose of this money. I believe God is like that fish. He's brought that fish to the surface for Peter that he's bringing to the surface of our lives new things never before seen by us in our professions, in our, in, in our industries or careers or ministry. I believe he's opening the mouths of fishes for us in our professions. He's partnering with us. He's opening the mouths of those things for new inventions in our career. He's opening the eyes 
of our understanding to see new industries come out of this chaos. He's opening the eyes of our understanding to see even new clientele in our, in our book of business. He's opening our eyes to see new judges with new ideas that are righteous and new, new attorneys to represent the righteous laws. He's opening up new moves in new places. There's new waves of revival coming from chaos. Out of the darkness, God speaks light. And so the principle here is cooperating with God at this time in our professions. Cannot overemphasize right now the need for wise counsel. In Proverbs eleven fourteen, we read, where no counsel is, the people fall, but in the multitude of wise counselor, there is safety. The word safety in the amplified there is also means victory. And the word fall, where no counsel is, the people fall. In the living Bible says they go off course like a ship without a helm. Without wise counsel, we may have a ship. But without wise counsel, it's easy to go off course in these days uh, where the, the media is very emotional about this COVID-19. We need wise counsel, biblical counsel, godly wisdom about money, possessions, and our careers. In Proverbs 15, 22, the, the need for counsel is emphasized further, saying, without counsel, purposes are disappointed. But with a multitude of counselors, purposes are established. And so wise counsel will help us to succeed in the plans God has for us. And so Proverbs 24, 6 finishes this need for counsel by saying, don't go to war without it. Don't go to war without it. Wise counsel will bring safety and victory in the time of turmoil. Now, to some practical advice. In the steps of financial planning, one of the first things that we'll always want to do is to assemble a, a wise team of advisors. Now, this team can comprise of various professionals. I'm often asked, well, can I do this on my own? And, you know, the answer, bottom line is, you know, you could. It's kind of like, it's kind of like cooking. You know, could I cook a meal for my family? In fact, I do sometimes. But it's not a seven-course banquet, I can tell you that. Um, cooking in the kitchen can range all the way from a microwave all the way to the seven-course gourmet meal. Now, if I'm just going to pop a little meal in the microwave, I don't need to get instructions or read a menu or find out the recipe. I just punch a button. So in that regard, if, if all you have is a one aspect to your plan, you have one question, or you have one simple decision to make, you don't have to hire a whole team of elaborate advisors. But that team can range all the way from not having uh, any, all the way to having a great team of the following, attorneys, CPAs or accountants, investment advisors, insurance agents, bankers, brokers, and always work within the kingdom with referrals from other kingdom ambassadors who have had good experiences with their team. So you want to assemble a team in its proportion and depth to the, to the seriousness and the, and the complexity of your issue. Again, if all you have to do is make one, one little decision in one area, maybe you can do some of that on your own with your online study and the help of an eye, the eyes of a good friend who knows what they're doing in the kingdom. But more and more, especially in times like this, I highly recommend that you assemble a godly team of advisors where a multitude of counsel can be given to you, giving you safety, victory, and success on your way. Secondly, secondly is what we just discussed. What is the purpose of God in my life? What are the goals that God has established in my calling and my life? 
And so that takes time, but we can often divide God's will into short-term, medium range, and long-term goals. Short-term, probably everything from right now till the next three years. Medium-term, from the third year to the tenth year. And the Lord, if the Lord tarries, let's keep that in mind. Long-term is anything beyond ten years. And you say, well, you know, shouldn't we be thinking about Jesus coming back? Absolutely. We should be prepared for him to come right now. But we should plan and live as if he will come back in a hundred years. Because one of the last things we'll share today is multi-generational transfers of wealth, gifting, anointing, and blessing. And so we should be prepared as if he's coming tonight as kingdom ambassadors, but be planning and be looking out for the next generation of godly people. So one, assemble the team. Two, establish your goals. Three, determine your, what we call risk profile. What's a risk profile? It's your ability to tolerate, it is your ability to tolerate risk. And what do I mean by risk here? It is your tolerance for losing money. Risk, I'll define here. Your tolerance and your chemical makeup, your personality as it reacts to a financial loss. And so there are several different ways we, we will measure risk. We measure risk by either conservative. That means I don't want to ever lose a penny of my money. You know, and if that means I give up opportunities in the market, I don't want to buy stock. I want it to be guaranteed. I want a fixed result. That's conservative. Or moderate. Moderate would mean, look, I'm willing to take some risks. So if I open up my statements and I see it, I've lost 5%, I'll stay with it. But when we get down into double digits, I can't stomach that. I want to be able to sleep at night as well as eat well during the day. So conservative or moderately conservative and then moderate. And then we get into a moderate aggressive where you know, you're know you shooting for higher results than just a fixed rate of return. You'd like the opportunity, not the guarantee, but the opportunity for future results that could outperform the guaranteed types of investments. And then lastly would be aggressive or hyper aggressive, you know, and this is people that are willing to just throw money, good money after bad money because they know that eventually they're going to hit a home run. Well, you know, not everyone has that tolerance, but you, you know, there's no completely right or completely wrong tolerance. It's just like us. You have to know how you're made. How did God make you? What is your ability to tolerate volatility? And that's something that your team can help you with. Fourthly, is take an inventory of your current assets and current resources. Where are you today? What is point A? And then fifthly, set some strategies in place to get from where you are right now to where God has uh, made, made, a, made it clear that he wants you to be. Asking God for wisdom all along the way with your team looking over your shoulder in a multitude of wise counsel bringing you safety and checking the map along the way to make sure you haven't taken the wrong turn. Making sure that seventhly that you review your plan periodically. And so that is the beginning of the financial planning process. Now, to conclude this section of our discussion, I will remind you again that though I am registered with FINRA, the Financial Regulatory Agency of America, I am not representing a broker-dealer today on this program. I am not, in fact, taking any clients. I am, I am a godly father, grandfather, first of all, and then I am also a teacher, an author, and a certified planner. I do have a book I'd like to share. And if you're interested in hearing more about some of the things that we just discussed, about the purpose of money, about how to assemble a team, and then talking about all kinds of various life stages, college funding for your children, retirement funding, various options here uh, on elder law. We are, co we are pleased to be a, 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 one of the authors with a very well-known marriage and family counselor in America, Ron Deal as well as attorney David Edwards 
and I want to give you a great website. If you'd like to go in and, and learn some more tips, in fact, 10 tips to start getting going on your financial plan, you should Google, you should Google www.blendedfamilyfinances.com. That's blendedfamilyfinances.com. And my co-author, attorney David Edwards, has compiled some really nice, concise principles that you could take the next steps from what we're talking about today. All right, we're looking forward to some more in just a moment. Thank you, Ariel. Thank you, Pressy. Welcome back to Kingdom Talk, and I am Greg Pettis, a teacher and author on the subject of biblical finances, money, and possessions. Just as a quick reminder, we are not uh, giving specific investment, tax, or legal advice. Neither, neither am I uh, in my financial advisory role as a certified financial planner. But today it's about kingdom talk around what does God say about the purpose of money and where, where are our values? Because wherever our heart senses treasure, there our heart will follow. And so we, we talked about vision. We talked about the fact that as Dr. Miles Monroe so aptly said, that eyes that see are common, but eyes that can look with vision are rare. That sight is a function of the physical eyes, but that vision from God is a function of the heart. And Helen Keller once said, you know, there's nothing worse than being blind except being able to see and not have a vision. Jesus said that the eyes are the windows of our lives. And if our eyes are, are perceptive, spiritually clear, and then our whole lives are full of his light. And you know, these days, today with the coronavirus, it is a time of chaos and it's a time of uncertainty. But one thing's for sure, this is a time that we can spend in clarifying what is it that God has in his will for us. And it's a time of clarity. It's a time of simplification. When we're forced to be contained in a quarantine, uh, we have faith, family, and friends. And it's a time of purifying. It's a time of, of unifying. Some of us, we've not been able to connect like we have now with, our, with, with more time to do that. And certainly it's a time to glorify God in all we do. So we've talked about vision, kingdom vision. God has a purpose for money. We should ask God, what is the purpose of this resource that you put in my hand? You being my source, what was the purpose of this money, this possession? Because it should all have the finger of God on it. And he is the uh, source of, and he is the one that we can go to and ask for wisdom. Because in a multitude of counselors, Proverbs eleven fourteen, there is safety. And another version says there's victory. Proverbs fifteen twenty two again says when there's no counsel, then purposes are disappointed. But when we have a multitude of counselors, purposes are established. And certainly that's what we want. We want clarity as partners with God in our professions, in our industry, in our career, in our ministry, as Peter did when he was uh, fishing for the shekel to pay the half shekel for he and Jesus, that temple tax that was due. And uh, God's son, Jesus, could have put the money from the bag that he carried, but that money had its own purpose. That was for ministry sustenance. And so this money from the mouth of the fish, this was to have a purpose of paying a tax. And so, you know, here's a man that knew what he was doing, but he was depending on God. And if we know our God, we too will be strong and do exploits. And so if we're willing and obedient, we will also eat the best of the land, Isaiah 119. So now we've gone from the power of vision to practical steps that you can take to begin a plan. We talked about the seven steps, starting out with your assembling of a team. 
Now that team doesn't have to be complex, but it should be godly, because in godly wisdom there's victory and safety. And that team doesn't have to be, you know, so uh, in depth that it includes everyone, but it should con it should con contain uh, the uh, the level and depth of advice needed for the project or the assignment that God has given us. So we might need an attorney to draft a document, a trust, a will, a living will, a power of attorney, both for finances and for health care. We might need to have uh, life directives uh, regarding our future. That would be very good for our loved ones, not to have to worry and wonder what is our wishes and to wonder what is our desire for our possessions and our, our health care. So the attorney is a very important element of a financial planning process. Of course, each nation that is represented here has its own legal format, its own structure, its own laws. And so that's why it's important that you receive specific legal advice in the jurisdiction in which you live. But if you'd like some good basic uh, financial planning information, a book that was just put out by uh, two authors and myself, Ron Deal, David Edwards, and I, uh, on the many uh, topics that we've covered today and all the others that we don't. It's 200 pages of great stuff. And the attorney that I reference here has a good website that you can go to. It's called blendedfamilyfinances.com. And this book is available on Amazon if you'd like to look at it. All right, let's jump into some more kingdom principles regarding finances, money, and possessions. And this one is about an exciting topic called multi-generational wealth and blessing transfer. Multi-generational wealth and blessing transfer. We see in Genesis that God revealed himself as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so God, in his, in his view as the great I am, is always thinking of multiple generations. He didn't just bless Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, 1 through 3, but all the nations of the earth. Yes, we, as children of Abraham, are blessed with the blessings of Abraham. And so God was looking at you when he blessed Abraham. And God is now looking at your progeny. He's looking at your children. He's looking at your grandchildren and great-grandchildren. If the Lord tarries, and if he doesn't, then even in the near future, there are anointings and blessings and, 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 and wealth deposits that God wants to use now to get his word out, now to go throughout all the world. So let's look at Proverbs 13, 22, a great scripture that talks about this multi-generational wealth transfer. If you want to go there, King James says, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. In the Hebrew, b'nai b'nim, it's not just grandchildren. In passages that we see uh, in other passages in Exodus, benim benim can mean third and fourth generation. A good person, a person born again by the Spirit of God, righteous in Christ, leaves an inheritance to his children's children. You say, well, I don't have a bunch. Well, you know, we're not talking about mega wealth here. We're talking about everything that God has given you. We're talking about everything. We're talking about not just money and possessions, but your gifting, your anointing, even your ability and character that's being influencing others. It is impacting others, and it now will be imparted to others. Well, that scripture is such a very encouraging one to me. I have a father of six children and a grandson, but also I believe that many of you out there in addition to your, to your natural children, you have what we would call spiritual children, of course, as a kingdom ambassador. And so the question is this, when we are looked at as for our success, do we have a successor? Who is going to take the deposits? Who's going to be imparted to? 
who's going to be the beneficiary of our blessing. So it doesn't have to be the inheritance that happens at the end of life. There are inheritances that are being received while we're living. A good man leaves an inheritance, yes, to his children's children, but let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 26, where we read in the King James, for God gives to a man that is good in his sight wisdom and knowledge and joy. But it goes on to say, but to the sinner he gives travail to gather, to heap up, that he may give to him that is good before God. And that's Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 26. So it doesn't have to happen. You don't have to wait to the end of life to leave an inheritance. There are living mantles that when we are associating with kingdom ambassadors are being transmitted to our, to our uh, spiritual children. And so again, back to Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 26, it says again, God gives to a man or a woman that is good, that's his children, wisdom, knowledge, and joy. And here is a transferal of kingdom blessing. A classic passage in Luke chapter 12, verses 16 through 21. I'm reading from the Amplified, Luke 12, 16 through 21. <clears throat> He's telling people to keep free from covetousness. A man's woman's life does not ex consist in, in or derive from possessions. In verse 16, he went on to say, he told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man was fertile and yielded plentifully. And he considered and debated within himself, what shall I do? I have no place in which to gather together my harvest. And he said, now listen to all the selfishness. I will do this. I will pull down my storehouses and I will build larger ones and there I will store all my grain or produce and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many good things laid up, enough for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink and enjoy yourself. But God said to him, now listen to what the Lord is saying here. You fool, this very night, the messengers of God will demand your soul of you and all the things that you have prepared. Here's the question God is asking us. Whose will they be? Whose will they be? That's Luke 12, 20. What a question regarding multiple generational transfers of blessings, both during life and at passing to glory. Whose will they be? Someone once said, I think so aptly, we really have no success without a successor. And so it's exciting to me to see that there truly is a transfer. Um, we are very pleased to have six wonderful children. They're all so powerfully gifted of God. And aren't they all so unique? You parents have more than, than uh, one child. You know what I'm talking about. And of course, all of us are, are spiritual parents. Everyone is unique. And each one of them has their own capacity to receive. And they have uh, their, uh, the, the ability to receive both now and later. And they will receive from us both in word and deed. And some things are taught and some things are caught. Now, a classic passage about multiple generations of transfers is in Matthew 25, 14 through 30. If you want to go there with me, it is the classic parable of the talents. But the talents can represent not just units of financial value and, 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 and measurements and exchange, but can, they can be actually uh, symbolic of giftings, anointings, and blessings that we can transfer to other people. Let's go there now. In Matthew 25, verses 14 through 30, Jesus was telling us that a man loaned this money to the three individuals to invest. In the New Living Translation, it says he entrusted this money to the three people. Of course, when Jesus ascended on high, we read in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8, that he gave gifts unto men. So it's not just money and possessions, but the anointings, again, the blessings in our callings that we are asked by God to 
diligently and patiently and consistently invest in other people. Now there were three individuals. One received five talents, one received two talents, and one received one. But if you look at a parallel passage in Luke chapter 19, starting in, in about verse 10, it says that he gave all 10 people one pound. And what happened with the Luke 19 passage was that one individual took, turned the one pound into 10, while the other one turned his one pound into five, and the other ones hid their money. But in this passage, we have five, two, and one. Now, the, the folks with five talents and the two talents, they were given these talents according, it says, to their individual capacities. God designed us with capacities, levels of, of ability to receive from him. And that can, be tr that can be developed by the Holy Spirit in our spirit. So what happened was that you know that the five talented and the two talented individual, they went and traded and gained in the King James, while the other one digged and hid in the earth his Lord's money. Now notice, the one who hid the talent, he didn't, he didn't mis misspend it. He didn't embezzle or gamble with it. He just hid it. And it says in verse 24, the reason that he did this was, he said, I knew you, that you're a hard man. Uh, you reap where you haven't sown, and I was afraid. And wouldn't you know that the opposite of the faith that it takes to invest in other folks and watch God multiply is fear. Listen to what he said. He said, I knew you. Now, did he really know the Lord or, or did he know religious views of the Lord? <laughs> what a big difference. Maybe he had the form of, of power, form of deity, form of religion, but without the power. He said, I know you're a hard man. In other words, in the, in the message, it says, I knew you have high standards and you demand the best. But I was afraid, and listen to what he says here in the message version. I was afraid that you would rob me of what I earn. And so it wasn't all just fear. He actually, it was about greed. And that's, it, refers, it refers me back to what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, that the eyes of the body are the, the doorway, the window. If our eyes are spiritually perceptive and clear, set on Jesus, our whole life is filled with, 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 with all the goodness of Jesus. But if our eyes are squinty with greed and distrust, it says in the message version. If our eyes are squinty with greed and distrust, then our rest of our lives are dank and dark like a cellar. And don't you know that it all starts with vision and starts with the heart. But this, this fellow here, here was afraid and he hid his talent in the earth. When the Lord says the Lord after a long time, the Lord of those servants came and reckoned with them. He settled accounts. And don't you know, sometimes it does seem like a long time that we're being faithful with our hands to the plow. Let us not be weary in well-doing. My friends, let us continue to be obedient with our finance, money, and possessions as kingdom ambassadors because there will be a day when Jesus will come and he says he will settle accounts. And what he said to the one that hid is very sobering to me. He said, you, you wicked and slothful servant. He was furious. Not that he's, he did anything like gamble with the money. He didn't like misspend it. He just hid it. He said that it means you're an unprofitable servant and you've, you've placed yourself outside my kingdom in a place of outer darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. What power is in that? Power? That's the fear of the Lord about being faithful with what we've been given. Now here's what Jesus does with those who do not seek his face for vision find the purpose of their gifting and anointings and their abilities and their money and possessions, and then take it into the marketplace as kings and priests in order to use it and make it grow and talents 
that can be imputed and imparted to our children and grandchildren. He said, take the talent from the one that had one and give it to the one that has 10. And I thought, what? What about the guy with five? You know, the guy who had two, I mean, and turned it into four. No, he's, he's giving the extra blessing, listen, to the one who took the most risk. Now, sure, that the, the, the guy with two who turned it into four and the one with five who turned it into ten were both told the same thing. Well done, thou good and faithful servants. You've been faithful over a little, a few things, and I will make you ruler over many things. But he took the one talent and gave it to the guy who had five and turned it into ten because he took the most risk. We know the old saying, no risk, no reward, and certainly that can, that can work in this also. And so the question is, as we begin to wind down today, is what is it that God has given us that can be considered a talent? What anointings, what ministry giftings, what abilities, in addition to the finances and the money and the possessions, do we currently know that we have? that we could take to the Lord and say, what is the purpose of this money, this blessing? Give me vision, let me see things like you showed Peter down at the lake when he went fishing for his shekel tax. What, <clears throat> what is it that you want me to do when the money appears at the surface of my profession, when the money comes as it would miraculously out of my industry or my career? What is it you want me to be doing with it? What is it that you had in mind, Lord? but certainly not to become afraid. This is not the day to be afraid. It's the day to be strong, to know our God, and to do exploits. And so to, as I begin to finish, I just wanna say thank you to Ariel and thank you to Percy uh, for the opportunity to be a kingdom ambassador here and share on the Kingdom Talk Philippines. I will look forward to our next session. Meanwhile, may the best blessings be yours in Jesus' name. Wow, amen. What yes. a powerful word, Coach Presley. And I have learned a lot for <laughs> yes, tonight, Coach especially Ryan. you, Coach Presley, because you can relate what he says because you are uh, in the area of what of this expertise of this, of Sir Gregory. Yes, <laughs> I know. And uh, Coach Ariel, uh, really that uh, we need this, uh, what's this, this principle to be adapted in our yes. lives. To manage... manage Yes. The, re the resources. resources that God has entrusted them to mm -hmm. us. The yes. call. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. And I know that we have learned a lot. So this is all for tonight, Coach Ariel. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sir Gro Gregory, for that message. And yes. extend our best regards to Until your next time. 